This is a picture test in practical neuroanatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer, then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the sectional anatomy of the brain. Identify the white matter fiber bands 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is a horizontal section through the cerebral cortex at the level of the interventricular foramen showing white matter structures. The fornix is a bundle of association fibers in the limbic system. It begins as a sheet of myelinated accents on the ventricular surface of the hippocampus called the alveus. The fibers aggregate at the medial region of the hippocampus as the fimbria. The fimbria continues as the crus at the posterior limit of the hippocampus beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum. In a horizontal section, the shape of the fibers forming the splenium is called forceps major, as appears in 3. You can see the crus here, 2, at the region of the trigon of the lateral ventricle. The trigon marks the posterior end of the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle where the hippocampus forms a floor. The crust of the fornix curves around the posterior end of the thalamus and joins its counterpart to form the body of the fornix. This should take place at a higher section than this one, so we don't see the body of the fornix. The body of the fornix then separates anteriorly into columns, two columns each of which curves downward and backwards. Thus, it can be seen again in this section in the anterior part. Note the column of the fornix in one. The column of the fornix here forms the anterior boundary of the interventricular foramen, while the anterior end of the thalamus forms the posterior boundary of the foramen. The white matter in four represents the fibers of the optic radiation, also known as the geniculocalcarine tract. This is a collection of axons projecting from relay nucleus here in the thalamus, the lateral geniculate body, and carry visual information to the occipital lobe along the calcarine sulcus. Identify the nucleus A, name the three other related nuclei, and identify the region B. The nucleus is the dentate nucleus. It has a regular outline and can be easily distinguished even in unstained section. It appears somewhat darker than the surrounding white matter. It is the most lateral of the cerebellar nuclei. The other cerebellar nuclei are located medial to it. They are the emboliform, globos, and fastigial nucleus, which is the most medial. The dentate nucleus is the largest of the four and can be easily distinguished. Axons of Purkinje cells terminate on these nuclei and almost all output from the cerebellum originates from the cells in these nuclei. B is the vermis. The vermis is the central region of the cerebellum. It is bounded bilaterally by the cerebellar hemispheres. Also note the folia and the sulci of the cerebellar cortex. The presence of these folia and sulci will make a section of the vermis looks like a section in a tree. Hence the name arbor vitae, means tree of life, is used to describe the appearance of the vermis in a mid-sagittal section. Arrange the sections in a rostrocaudal direction. These are axial MRI sections. A is at the level of the interventricular foramen, which communicates between the lateral and third ventricles. The section shows the thalami on either side of the third ventricle. C shows the body of the lateral ventricle, in which the thalamus forms a floor. Thus, it must be at a higher level than A. B shows the midbrain, which is located below the thalamus. Thus, it is at a lower level than A. Therefore, 
the sequence of the section in a rostrocaudal direction is C A B. Regarding the second part of the question, which section shows cerebral aqueduct? The cerebral aqueduct is shown in B, traversing the midbrain. Body of the lateral ventricle is shown in C, which also contains the choroid plexus. The posterior horn of the lateral ventricle is variably developed and is shown in A. The fornix, number 4, is also shown in A, just anterior to the interventricular foramen. Note here that the posterior boundary of the interventricular foramen is the anterior end of the thalamus. The third ventricle, number 5, is also seen in section A. It is located in the midline between the two thalami and connected to the lateral ventricle via the interventricular foramen. Identify gyri A, B, and C. The location of the three gyri is shown on a coronal section of the brain. A is located on the medial side of the cerebral hemisphere, just above the corpus callosum, it is the cingulate gyrus. B is located on the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere, just inferior to the lateral sulcus. It is the uppermost gyrus of the temporal lobe, that is, the superior temporal gyrus. You can trace the other gyri, middle and inferior temporal gyri as well. C is located on the inferior surface of the cerebral hemisphere, most medially, and it is the parahippocampal gyrus. Starting with one, which of the following combinations constitutes the sequence of the pathway taken by the fibers? The pathway starting at one is located in a section of the midbrain, the most anterior part of which is the crust cerebri, which contains corticofugal fibers, corticopontine, corticobulbar, and corticospinal fibers. Now, as the name of these projecting fibers indicate, they arise in the cerebral cortex, cortico, and then they descend, spinal, or bulbar, or pontine. We can follow them as they descend in the next section of the pons, where they form the longitudinal fibers that traverse the basilar part of the pons. So they can be either two or three. Fibers labeled as four represent the horizontal pontocerebellar fibers, so they are excluded. The descending fibers, they do not cross at this level. Therefore, they should continue on the same side as one, so they continue in three. The next level section is a section of a closed medulla oblongata at the level of the sensory decussation. The corticospinal fibers continue in the pyramid, Thus, 5 is excluded because 5 represent the fasciculus cuneatus of the dorsal column pathway. Since the level of sensory decussation is higher than the level of motor decussation, where corticospinal fibers cross, therefore, the fibers at this level are still uncrossed, and they continue from 3 to 7. The last section is a section of the spinal cord in which 10 is excluded for being part of the dorsal column pathway, which is sensory. 9 is the lateral corticospinal tract. And this constitutes 75 to 90% of the pyramidal fibers that decussate in the pyramidal decussation. The remaining non-crossed fibers, they constitute the anterior corticospinal tract in 8. Now returning to the medullary section, the fibers in the pyramid at 7 cannot continue as the anterior corticospinal tract at 8 because the fibers at 7, at a lower level, level of motor decussation, they either cross to the other side and form the lateral corticospinal tract 9 or they remain on the same side as the anterior corticospinal tract so they cannot continue as the ventral corticospinal tract of 8 because 8 is present on the other side of 7. Fibers in 8 could continue from 6, but not from 7. Therefore, the sequence here of the pathway starting at 1 is 
1, 3, 7, and 9. Match the result of damage to each of these regions. This is a section of the open part of the medulla, which is the upper part, the part that does not contain a central canal, but in which the canal opens to form the floor of the lower part of the fourth ventricle. Note the crumpled back shape of the large principal olivary nucleus that characterizes the upper medulla. Dorsolaterally, the medulla is connected to the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. A. The inferior cerebellar peduncle is composed of fibers entering the cerebellum, called the restiform body, which makes the bulk of the peduncle. Remember that the dorsal spinocerebellar tract enters the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Thus, damage of the inferior cerebellar peduncle results in ataxia. 1. B is located in the reticular formation. It represents the region of the nucleus ambiguous. The nucleus cannot be clearly seen because it is formed of a small group of motor neurons. These neurons aggregate medial to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal and above the dorsal accessory olivary nucleus. The nucleus ambiguous is the source of motor fibers providing innervation to the muscles of the pharynx, palate, and larynx, and to the striated muscles of the upper end of the esophagus. Most of these muscle fibers are supplied by the vagus nerve. Damage thus results in difficulty in swallowing, that's to say dysphagia. C represents the axons comprising the corticospinal tract as they traverse the pyramid. These pyramidal fibers are upper motor neurons that ultimately terminate on contralateral anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. The corticospinal tract conveys motor information for the execution of learned skilled movement and its damage results in hemiparesis. The word hemi means one side while paresis means weakness. Because the tract is crossed, the weakness affects the contralateral side of the body. Which of the following best describes the efferent fibers from nucleus 1? This is a section of the closed part of the medulla oblongata at the level of the motor decussation. Nuclei appear lighter than fiber tracts in this stain. One is a light area and it is thus a nucleus. It is the nucleus cuneatus located just lateral to the nucleus gracilis. The gracile nucleus begins to form somewhat more caudally than the cuneate nucleus. Thus, it looks bigger in this section. It is expected that in a higher level section, the nucleus cuneatus will become bigger. Neurons in these two nuclei are second order sensory neurons. They belong to the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway and they receive fibers of fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. These fibers carry discriminative touch, proprioception, and vibration senses. Neurons of these two nuclei give rise to axons that comprise the internal arcuate fibers, which cross the midline in the sensory decussation located at a slightly higher level to form the medial lemniscus. Now let's examine the options here. Which of the following best describes the efferent fibers from nucleus 1? A. Project to the medial geniculate body. The projection to the medial geniculate body involves fibers that are auditory in function. In fact, the fibers projecting from 1, from the nucleus cuneatus, they terminate on the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Regarding B, this is the ultimate destination projection to the post-central gyrus. The ultimate destination of the whole tract, the post-central gyrus containing the primary somesthetic area, but the fibers arising from the cuneate nucleus, they should relay in the thalamus, the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, before they project to the cerebral cortex in the post-central gyrus. C, enter the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle. This describes the fibers of the ventral spinocerebellar tract and is not related to the 
fibers arising from the nucleus cuneatus. D best describes the efferent fibers from the nucleus. They form the medial lemniscus after crossing. E, the medial longitudinal fasciculus is concerned with coordination of eye movements and is connected to the vestibular nuclei and the motor nuclei of cranial nerves that supply the extraocular muscles and is not related to the cuneate nucleus.